Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have to say that um, it's a joy to be in God's house on Epiphany, January 6th. You know, it's a tough time because uh, we've been doing a lot of church lately. Uh, there's been uh, Advent and Christmas Eve and uh, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and all the normal stuff that we try to get done too. And then to add a service at the beginning of January, this is our second year of having an Epiphany service. Uh, seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it really is important, and I'm glad that you're all here. It's a Friday night to boot, uh, but what a witness to the world uh, and to the church uh, when we continually hear people begging for uh, keeping Christ in Christmas, we here are concluding our Christmas celebration, essentially, in God's house as God's people. Today is Epiphany. And in uh, ancient times, and for many Christians even still today, Epiphany is a more prominent celebration than uh, December 25th. The 12 days of Christmas are over. We are in Epiphany. May I suggest, uh, just a, a, a thought, um, if you're willing, maybe leave your Christmas decorations up at home uh, until Epiphany, and not pack them away uh, on the second or third day of Christmas. And today is not just the feast of the Epiphany, it also marks the beginning of the season of Epiphany, which I believe is one of the most important and sadly one of the least celebrated seasons of the Christian calendar. Even churches, I, this is really interesting to me, I have a very good friend who is um, a Baptist pastor and uh, until recently he was in Colorado and he just moved to uh, his home state uh, to serve a church in Kentucky. He's, very, he's a very good friend and we have a lot, obviously we have a lot in common but um, there's also many things upon which we do not agree. But uh, it, it, he has lately, and I don't think he's the only one, been starting to observe more and more of these traditions that the Baptist church are not particularly known for observing. Things like Advent, Lent. Um, he, you know, he was he's been introducing these things in his church. And I don't think they, they're, they're doing epiphany yet. But it's interesting because he and I have these discussions, and he asks me questions. And, and I sent him a book that we use at the seminary called The Year of Our Lord. I think it's called The Year of the Lord. It's a, a study of the, of the origins of our church year uh, festivals. The season of epiphany for us is the bridge between Christmas and Lent. Lent comes a little earlier this year. Uh, Ash Wednesday is on February 22nd, and so Epiphany is that period in between Christmas and Lent. The word Epiphany, I actually got into a Facebook discussion about this this week, it's interesting. The word Epiphany comes from the Greek, and it means manifestation, or it can mean an unveiling or showing of something. Well, in Jesus... God is manifesting or showing or uh, revealing or unveiling his true attitude towards human beings, his mercy and kindness. This season is all about God bringing light and clarity and enlightenment to people who are otherwise stumbling around in the dark, in the shadow. I love this uh, Isaiah 60 passage. That, uh, that George read, Isaiah chapter 60. The first few verses I'll share with you once again. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. It has been long thought, believed by Christians who read this chapter, that that last part there is referencing those kings, the wise men, uh, the magi. In Matthew chapter 2, it says, Nations shall come to your light. Kings shall come to the brightness of your rising. Jesus Christ is God's light in a dark world. And he draws people to him. Now, one of the meanings of epiphany 
one of the themes is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all people. He did not just come to be uh, the King of the Jews. He did not just come to save the Israelites. But he came to be the salvation for all human beings, no matter what tribe or race or ethnic background or social status you have. And it's one of my goals for Redeemer of 2012 in this year to maybe help us to become a bit more globally minded as a congregation. Americans have a tendency to be rather um, uh, sort of looking in on just ourselves, our own issues, our own problems. We have a tendency to be a little bit ignorant, don't we, of the rest of the world. And not only ignorant, you see, mere ignorance can almost be forgiven. What is worse than being ignorant of the rest of the world, I think, is being uninterested in the rest of the world. I was sitting in my favorite coffee shop on Thursday, and uh, there were two young college students sitting at the table next to me, and I couldn't help overhearing snippets of their conversation. And at one point, uh, they were talking about Rio de Janeiro. And uh, one of them asked the other, where is Rio anyway? And the, the second one said, I don't know, but I think it's in South America. Now, I hate to pick on anyone, and, and I could just as easily have you know, not known where a place is. I don't know my geography, world geography, as well as I should. But these were college students. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not like Rio de Janeiro is some obscure village in the boonies. Okay? Uh, Rio de Janeiro is a city about the same size as Chicago. Okay? It's the sixth largest city in the Western Hemisphere. And they couldn't identify where, that was, where it was. It's a fairly famous place. So I was a little concerned by that. That is an example, I think, of the level of um, global disinterest that really we shouldn't, we shouldn't accept, that we shouldn't tolerate, especially not in the church. And I'm not saying we all have to be geography B winners. What I'm saying is that it is not a good thing for citizens, but also for the church, to be so uninterested in the world that we live in and unknowledgeable about the world we live in. In the book of Revelation, St. John was given a vision of what heaven looks like, and this is what he wrote. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. The kingdom of God is filled with people from every nation, from all walks of life, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Now look around. Uh, Elmhurst is a fairly homogeneous community, you know, but uh, you know, ethnically and racially. But even in Elmhurst, I can walk up and down the sidewalks of Uptown and hear five or six different languages. I've been noticing. And uh, it, even in this fairly uh, lily-white community is a growing ethnic diversity. What does this mean? Among other things, Epiphany is the most mission-oriented of the church seasons. Our missionary impulse comes from Christ himself, who told the disciples in Acts chapter 1, that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Not just to our neighbors, not just to the uh, city of Chicago, not just to uh, uh, the western suburbs, but to the ends of the earth. Now, not everyone has to go and preach the gospel in the jungles and rainforests to accomplish this. And even though, like I said, Elmhurst is a fairly homogeneous community, the opportunity still exists for us. The opportunity for us to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ, I believe, has never been more ripe than it is now with technology and with the ability to travel and uh, with the fact that the ends of the earth are coming, coming here, coming to our shores. Take a look, if you would, in your bulletin to the uh, post-communion canticle. It's on the, almost the last page. Now, this post-communion canticle 
is uh, uh, one of several different options that we, that we use in our worship. This one is called the Song of Simeon. Its, it's Latin name, if you remember um, growing up with the Lutheran hymnal, its Latin name is called is the Nunc Dimittis. And um, Simeon was, uh, the Bible tells us uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, a very elderly Jewish believer whom the Holy Spirit had promised that he would not die until he had actually seen the Savior. Okay? And so one day when Mary and Joseph uh, went to the temple and they had the baby Jesus with them, they were in Jerusalem, so this is some time, I mean, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they're in Jerusalem now, and uh, they're taking Jesus there uh, probably for uh, a rite known as a consecration of firstborn son. And they're there, and they, see, they meet this old man, Simeon, and somehow, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he knows that that baby, that child, is the Savior that God had been promising and that he'd been waiting to see. And then he sang this song, and it was recorded for us, and we, I mean, not the music, he, I don't know what music he used, but the words, okay? And he says, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. So basically he's saying when he says, Lord, now your servant can go in peace. He's basically saying, well, I can die now because I've been waiting to see the Messiah. Now my eyes have laid eyes on, uh, I've laid my eyes on him. And then he uses this turn of phrase, which I think is a very nice epiphany phrase. He says, this is the light to reveal you to the nations, to all peoples, and the glory of your people Israel. You can imagine how encouraged and um, intrigued I was when, you know, I think many of you know, we videotape the sermons and put them on YouTube. And I, we don't get a lot of hits and we don't get a lot of uh, comments, but once in a while we do. And not that long ago, we got a, um, a comment from a young woman who said that she is in Ireland. And uh, now Ireland is a, you know, she could probably find a church there, but she hasn't found one. And so she, she uses these, these web um, videos of my sermons. And she said that those, these have been edifying to her. They've been helpful to her. My point is that we need to begin to think about God's mission to redeem the lost and to be thinking about all people. It has been said that the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning. The schools are integrated, the military is integrated, but for one reason or another, culturally, uh, our churches tend, you still have black churches, you still have Hispanic churches. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think of that passage in Revelation and I see all God's people from all, all backgrounds and all ethnicities. So tonight, we are considering the wise men who came from the East. We don't know how many there were. All we really know is that there were three gifts, so sometimes people think there were three of them. We don't know what their names are, although there are traditions about that. We don't know what countries they came from, but it's a pretty fair guess they may have come from Persia or Mesopotamia since those had uh, were world famous for being stargazing uh, cultures. But one thing we do know is that they were not Jews. They were the first non-Jews to come, and when they came to see the baby Jesus, they didn't just pay him homage. Did you see what it said? It said they knelt before, or they fell before him, and they worshipped him. They knew that this was not just some political king. They knew that this wasn't just going to be some kind of a social um, uh, uh, revivalist. That this was going to be, in fact, the savior of the nations. The savior of the world. The specific details about who the wise men uh, were are not all that terribly important to us. They worshipped him. And tonight, you are following in their footsteps. For tonight, you too will come to worship Jesus Christ. You too have come to see him. You will come, and like they did, you will bend your knee and at our altar. And you will 
worship and adore him. But you are going to receive a blessing that the wise men could not have imagined. Because tonight Jesus Christ will commune with you in the bread and the wine, bringing you abundant and never-ending life. One of the uh, final couple points here. One of the neat things that I love about Epiphany and the hymns of Epiphany and the readings that go along with the season is that they are very sensory oriented. I, you know, you know, we're reading, we're singing in this hymn about uh, the joys like flowers, and uh, we're we're talking about what was the um, the bit I think in the in the intro it. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. The wise men brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And, of course, frankincense and myrrh were, were um, ar- aromatic things. Our worship, when we come to worship the Lord, should involve all of our senses. It involves our our gestures, our body posture as we sit, as we kneel, as we stand, as we fold our hands, as we bow our heads. It involves the uh, visual beauty, the the stained glass for which this church is known in this community. The beautiful music that we hear from the organ and from other instruments and from the singing. And sometimes perhaps even olfactory. The use of incense has always been, long been used in Christian worship. Well, tonight I want to introduce a little thought um, about sort of everyday spirituality. It has been a long custom on Epiphany, January 6th. This dates from the Middle Ages. For people to take a piece of chalk and in the doorway and the lintel above their door at their home or where they dwell to make an inscription asking for Christ to bless their home and all those who live there uh, for the coming year. And this was a, a custom that I was not that familiar with until recently. But it, as I researched it, it uh, uh, you know, has a lot of Germanic uh, origin in the Germanic-speaking countries. It's also in England and in the British Isles and uh, all over the United States. And so one thing as you exit tonight, there's going to be a tin with little pieces of chalk. And I would encourage one family, one per family, to take a piece of chalk. And then I've got a little script that uh, is written there, and the customary thing to do on your lentil, and I'm going to do this tonight in our home. We're going to gather around, and we're going to write uh, the year 2012, and in between, you write the letters C-B-M-B, which stand for uh, the Latin, Christus Mansionum Benedicta, which means Christ bless our house. Doing a home blessing is something that I enjoy doing. I often have uh, published this in our newsletter where if if you have a new home or even if you don't and you just want to have prayer for your home life and your family that I come and we go into each room of your house and have a reading from the scripture and a prayer appropriate to what goes on in that room and we pray for your family. I love doing house blessings. Well, this is sort of a mini annual house blessing that you do, that we all do in our homes. So I would encourage you to do that if you put those letters. I've got a little script. It's written. It's printed out in the back so that we can. uh, This is this is associated with Epiphany because the wise men in Matthew chapter two, it says they didn't go to the manger in Bethlehem. They went to the house where Jesus was staying. And so we are asking for Jesus to bless our homes with his presence and with his light. This Epiphany and throughout the year. In Jesus name. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.